we're good. All right. Uh, we hope to go beyond the standard webinar and have a lot of social mixing. I think a critical part of meetings in meet space is, uh, is, is to engage with each other. And I hope we can translate that to here over the next coming sessions. The interaction will be driven by the Discord server that's running alongside these Zoom meetings. So please sign into that as well. There is a link in the group chat, the Zoom session to, for, for that. Uh, once we're done here with, with the speakers, please move to the Discord after the, the meeting and we'll have a sort of virtual coffee break. We'll be able to mix, ask more in-depth questions of the speakers and talk some science. And I invite anyone to join me in a virtual beer. Uh, today's session will be focusing on platforms driving bioinformatics data analysis, particularly methods for handling population size data sets. So, in that end, we have some very exciting talks from Gem and Joe at University of Warwick, Dan Fornicker from British Columbia CDC, and Dag Hampson from University of Munster. So first off, we have uh, Gem and Joe from Warwick. I used to work with Gem and back when I was at Warwick, and we, at that time we were developing Enterbase. Uh, Gem and did most of the back end and all of the CTMST methods, which I think he's gonna tell you more about today. He is currently working on reconstructing genomes from bacterial pathogens from ancient DNA and there's quite a few recent publications in that area that are well worth a read I think. Uh, but today Chairman will be talking about CGMST and hierarchical clustering approaches from Enterbase which I feel are instrumental for handling very large population size data sets. So Chairman if you want to take over. Yeah, hello. Yeah, I uh, hope everyone can hear me. Yeah, okay. And thank you, Nabil. And also thank you for everyone. And I hope you enjoy your time staying at home. Uh, I just realized that it has been like one month uh, in lockdown at home now. Uh, okay, today my talk is about intro base, which as Nabil mentioned, is the work we have done for the last uh, five years. Okay. Um, so I think most of you have already seen the figure in the left hand side uh, that shows the decreasing of the sequencing cost. At the meantime, then we see a lot of genomes being adapted into uh, public domain. Here I mentioned the genomes in intro base, uh, but we got most of our genomes uh, from Shorey archives in NCBI. So that actually shows the volume in NCBI as well. So that leads to the question that Nabil also proposed previously is that I will summarize it being 1 million challenge. There have already been over 1 million bacterial genomes in a CBI. And as you can see in the figure uh, here, that uh, we got several species to get over 100,000 uh, genomes already. And then in the next few, in the next five years, we are expect to get over 1 million public genomes for only two species, Samnera and Asherisha. I believe that some of other species may, uh, will catch up as well. So we get lots, lots of data. So how can we handle this? How we do taxonomy, how we analyze the genetic diversity and how we actually uh, chase back the transmission chains uh, using this data. Okay, uh, a traditional way is that we will use a SNP-based method. And I actually tried SNP-based method on these two data sets. One set is about 2,000 of paratype A genomes, and another set is 9,000 type A genomes. Both is causing uh, enteric fever, which is a very severe disease. And the problem is that given thousands of genomes, you will take a large server, and you take a long time to do the mapping, even longer time to do the, uh, to do the alignment and to do the phylogeny. And this thing is not scalable and it's not incremental. So doing this every time, it will be very painful. So what's the alternative? So it's the core genome MST. I hope most of you will know about core genome MST, which I will introduce briefly. But before that, uh, we can see a very quick comparison, see how these two are comparable. So uh, we can compare the storage space they are going to use for SNPs. You need to save the whole genome. So it will take about 8.6 gigabytes of storage. For CGM MST, you basically store only several integers. So it's take only 20 megabytes. The running time is also so similar that you get you can get a tree of like part type A 2000 genomes in only three minutes. So I actually summarize most of this result uh, in a publication here. 
Uh, this is mentioned uh, that we are using called grape tree. Uh, you will see it later, but this is the main idea here is that it's much, much more scalable using uh, uh, code your MST and a limb joining based method. You can see now built names in this paper. Okay, then we also compare the different results using SNPs, which is the left one, and comparing with the CGMST one is the neighbor joining tree. On the right hand side with the seven, 1700 genomes, you can see that in terms of uh, large lineages, they are almost identical. Uh, there's also a separate uh, comparisons uh, in CDF dataset comparing CGMST and SNPs using different uh, data sets, they are also getting the similar results. They are highly comparable, and the ratio is almost one-to-one. -one. I can see that Martinique is also in this session. I, okay. Uh, so I will go back five years and see that uh, our five year of developing of CGMST, we actually did lots lots of different methods around it, and we save all most of our data in intro base. We got some methods for metagenomic binning. We got methods for pan genome, core genome uh, reconstruction. We got all sorts of tools for assembling uh, draft genomes. We got visualization tool and many, many others. But if we summarize all together, it's intro base and here at Central Base, uh, there's about seven database pub in public domain, and then we got over 400,000 genomes already. And we got core genome typing method for four different gener uh, genera. And uh, okay, so the main idea is we just feed in short reads, and Intro Base will give you direct uh, phylogenetic analysis. Okay, so to do that, we need to introduce um, uh, ST multiple sequence typing. Uh, we have been using this uh, figure many times. Uh, this we start from uh, the traditional MST method, which is go back to over 20 years ago, uh, where we only do PCR sequencing and we got like six, seven or eight different genes. Uh, we get uh, 500 base pair fragments of the genes and we just do the typing based on the identity of the sequence. So a sequence either being identical or not, we ignore all the SNPs differences within the gene. So the main idea is use the whole gene instead of single basis for phylogeny. Uh, but uh, we quickly realized that seven genes is not enough. So we need to expand it. So during this effort, uh, we start with ribosomal MST and that's from uh, Oxford. We got codon MST, whole genome MST. And at the end, we decided that for most of phylogenetic analysis, we go with code genome MST because it's a trading between its uh, resolution and uh, uh, whether it's stable with the phylogeny. Okay, there's a very quick uh, scanning of how you set up a core genome MST. You start with either genes from a single genome or you start from a whole genome MST skin. And then you set up a set of reference genes. You do a blast search and identify all the genes, extract their sequences. And then after few, uh, several different criteria, you decide that which gene is suitable for the use of core genome MST. Uh, I don't want to go into that much detail, uh, but I just want to highlight that a uh, written uh, paper I made up. Uh, it's in the archive. It's about a tool called PEPA, in which case we actually reconstruct the pen genome of 3,000 streptococcus genomes using PEPA, and we identify that uh, we can find core genes even within the whole genus. Okay, uh, I go a bit too fast. Okay, uh, with all this developing of CGMST, and we then realized a problem for CGMST is that it gives you too much resolution. So we actually need a scheme to actually cluster CGMST results. So what we need to do is that given, for example, in some layer CGMST, you have 3,000 genes, you then need a sort of clustering method, which allows you go to different levels, like you want Gene, genomes differ by 100 genes or 1,000 genes, 2,000 genes. So what's the method? Well, we decided that we will go with single linkage clustering. 
That's a very quick demonstration of how single link casting is working. We start with a, like a network or every two sets of ST is sequence types are connected by a line. For example, ST1 and 2, they differ by one gene. ST1 and 3 differ also differ by one gene. And 2 or 3 differ by two different genes. The so different uh, numbers shown in different genes shows whether they are identical or different. Okay, if we do a, a single link clustering, that will be the result. All the red lines shows that the closest neighbor connecting each different ST types. What we can do is that if we take like uh, all the link, all the branches that differ by only one, we can draw a sort of groups. We call it HC1 hierarchical cluster one, and we give it different designations. Of course, we can then do HC2, HC5. As by doing this, we then actually set up a set of different classing results. Uh, for example, here are seven genes, then we can set up seven different levels. And then after this is set up, we make it run in entry base. Then we decide that we need to go to a production mode. In that mode, all the destination of the existing sequence types, we are not going to change it. Then, for example, if we're adding two new different S types, we then need to decide that which group it will fall in. For ST72, it's easy because it just connects to ST51. So it will group together with ST51. But for ST99, it's, it gets equal distance to ST3 and ST10. Then what's going to happen? Okay, we will just take the groups with the smaller ST number. So it will group together with ST3. By doing this, we guarantee that the designation, the clustering result of all the existing STs, they are not going to change, but the new ones can keep adding in incrementally. Okay, and then after doing that, we actually get like 3,002 different levels of clustering results. But not all of these levels are biologically biological meaningful. So what we are going to do is we need to find the best levels. One way we can do is that we can use some existing groupings. For example, in, uh, in E. coli, we can use uh, ST complex or we can use different species, cryptic lineages. In some nana, we have subspecies. But on top of that, we also use uh, something called silver coefficients. And this is a method which basically allows you to identify how good are the clusters by comparing the distance within the group with the distance between different groups. By doing this, we draw a curve and identify the best, the best cluster by showing the greatest uh, zero wave coefficient. Okay, and then uh, after all this theory work, some real data. Uh, here are the results. Uh, this is a cluster HC2850. This is actually equivalent. This is equivalent to the different subspecies uh, which has been previously defined. We can see a comparison between the taxonomy result, different subspecies versus the HC2850 uh, cluster result with several four different exceptions, or most of them actually looks uh, brilliant. We also do a similar things in E. coli, and in, in this case, we allow to reconstruct most of the cryptic lineages and also different species like Asheracia alberti, Foxoni, uh, by using a different cluster level, which is SC2350. And with this, we set up uh, a collection, which is called Echo R Plus and published uh, this early this year. This is referred to the earlier work uh, Howard Ackerman did uh, with the Echo R collection. Okay, there are different uh, levels which corresponding to species or subspecies level in all four genera. Then if we actually go deeper, I don't know why this is in here. Okay. If we go deeper, we can see that HC900, which I previously see with the greatest silhouette clustering or silhouette coefficient, it actually highly correlates with the EBGs in Samnella, 
or ST complex in uh, isolation coli. We actually found that CGMST and seven gene MST in these two species is actually recovered the same natural population uh, in them. Okay. And also, in some nella, it actually consistent with the cell typing results as well. We actually set up a mapping table uh, in our website showing that uh, you can reliably predict cellulose by the HC900 groupings. Okay, now I'm going to focus on very tiny part of this tree, which is Agama. Uh, the story of Gamma is that uh, for British, uh, they have the badges carry uh, bovis, and then they was uh, monitored and cut regularly. Uh, but I heard that they have stopped this uh, very bad thing recently. But now we see that it, during this uh, monitors, uh, there's a group of some Nena Agama. It was identified in a local population in Uchester. We got interest and we sequenced them. So here's the result. Uh, we actually got all the Agama genomes in entropy base and we draw a tree uh, using their CGMST results. Uh, each of the circle represents one ST type and the size of the circle actually represents the number of genomes being us. Uh, that's indistinguishable. What we found is that all the uh, badger agamas fall within a tiny group here, HC hierarchical level 400 and 299 group. If we actually go into a greater detail, what we realize that uh, the tree on top, uh, on the uh, top right, uh, here the tree, like that time we see that most of the uh, England badges, they form a single cluster here, whereas the human isolates are in the, uh, and at the root of this cluster. So we assume that those agamas, they were transmitted from, a, from British to badges. However, we set up a global collaboration. We get more isolates from Ireland, from France, uh, from Germany, and from Austria. By doing all these things, and then we realize that all these three assumptions are actually wrong. So at the very end, uh, in the tree, we actually report at the end. We see we got lots of badger isolates, not only in this big cluster, it's also uh, present in the other part of the tree. We also see multiple transmissions. Uh, we it's either from human to badger, from badger to human, or I think more likely they may just get uh, from some unknown sources. Okay, uh, if we actually then go even deeper into this uh, Uchest Lake, what we see is that uh, by doing geographic, uh, by putting all the genomes by their GPS coordinates, we see different tiny groups. All these groups according, uh, are actually consistent with high core casting clusters by 10 different, uh, by 10 allelic differences. They form separate groups and we can see these tiny transmissions within each of the group. This is also a benchmark uh, or demonstration using the badges, but we will expect the same uh, different uh, transmission chains and different tiny clusters. We also be able to see when if we use it on uh, human football outbreaks. Uh, actually, the uh, hierarchy clustering has also been used has already been used by some outbreak reports. Okay, uh, after all this, what's the future of the entropy base? And um, I set up uh, this demonstration. One thing is that we are going to focus on more and more for hierarchical clustering. We are going to set up a uh, topic page, which is a wiki-like page for every single hierarchical clustering clusters. Here in the demonstration, I show it for a result of HC900-202 which is Taifei. So this actually contains all this 9,000 Taifei I mentioned previously. Uh, we can reconstruct its tree using CGMST, which is almost 100% 100 consistent, uh, 100 consistent with the uh, SNP tree. And then in this, 
in this way, then if we set up an interface connecting the maps together with the trees, you can see if you select some nodes in the tree, you will see dynamic uh, visualization of its geographic locations. And also, re we recently developed a tool called Blood Frost. It's done by my colleague uh, Nina Ruman. Uh, she developed this method, allows searching of any gene in hundreds of thousands of genomes uh, very quickly. So by doing this, we actually be able to reconstruct, uh, retrieve all the AMR genes or even AMR SNPs in the genes and we map all these results into the tree. We can see clear patterns in the tree as well. And we also hope to use blood flows in other methods, uh, in other fields like profits, ICMEs. Okay, the conclusions is that codeine MST is highly scalable and pro reconstruct accurate phylogeny. A uh, second hierarchical clustering allows fine-grained real-time nomenclature of bacterial genomes and enterobase deposit large amount of genomes and also facilitate international collaborations. Okay, that's my end of my talk. And it's a big thank you for all of you and also for all our collaborators and especially all the uh, every all the groups in in our group. Uh, here's Nabil and here is the boss, uh, and Professor Mark Ackman, and these are all my colleagues. And thank you very much. That's it. All right, thank you, Jaren. That, that was really good. Um, I'm sure there's a thunderous applause from everyone at home. <laughs> but uh, I've already got a few. We've got time for uh, we have five minutes for a couple of questions. Um, mm -hmm. Dan, if you want to have your slides ready in the meantime, that would be good. But uh, one question I got. That's uh, here we go. So. There, this is a question about multiple CGMLST schemes for particularly for Salmonella. And the question is what makes the entry based CGMLST scheme better? And why, are, why is there such a difference in the number of genes used from different schemes? Well, yes, uh, I think back to five or six years ago, we actually tried to coordinate between different groups. We hope to set up a like only one systematic schemes, but uh, at the end, a fair part, there's multiple different schemes. I think one main key reason for entry based salmonella systematic scheme, for example, is being widely used is because of the data is not about the scheme. We actually gathered like over 200,000 genomes and we asked people to release and share all their data and as such, we actually got lots of user uploads and users can see the data from uh, other people. And by doing all this, you can actually share your data. You can actually do real-time epidemiology, check all the outbreaks. And also, uh, I think the hierarchical clustering, you will be become more and more important as well, because by doing that, you don't actually need to do any real phylogeny to be able to see what's the closest neighbor uh, in entropy base. And another question is about the size of the genes being used. I think it's multiple things, and but the most important thing will be whether you actually pick 100% or you pick a relaxed core genes. I know some of the schemes, they only allow the gene being 100% present, uh, but in my uh, personal evaluation, it's actually impossible if you go up to 200,000 genomes, you know, no single gene will be universally present. You have to do a relaxed call. For example, you allow genes present in 98% of the genomes. In that case, you will be, get a much larger uh, set of core genes. Okay. Okay, uh, one popular question that's coming in is, is there any way to call hierarchical clustering with tools, with other tools, other than having to upload your data to Entropase? Uh, technically, well, yes and no. Uh, first thing is that it's yes, because I actually include uh, hierarchical clustering tools in my package, which is called eToki. You can find it in, uh, my GitHub repository, but it's also no, because if you do in that way, you basically cannot compare your results with 
other people. In that case, if you've got only 100 genomes, well, it's good for a local outbreak, but it doesn't really help other people very much. So we actually encourage strongly to all the people to share your genomes because then you help yourself and also help others. Yeah, thank you. Okay, quite a few people saying thanks. Excellent talk. Um, one question that's come in says, were there any correlation between serotypes or serovars in Salmonella or E. coli in the higher CC MLST schemes? Ah, yes, I can cover this. Uh, we got brilliant correlation in HC900 in Salmonella, uh, but it's not the case. Okay, I got a comment. Yes, that's the link uh, from Curtis. That's the link. Okay, we go back to that. <laughs> in E. coli, uh, it's not the case because we found that the uh, serotypes sero actually change very, very quickly in E. coli. We hope to be able to see some correlation in lower level like HC100 or HC50, but we haven't evaluated that. Uh, I think uh, we actually set up a collaboration with uh, some the group uh, hope to be able to work this out. Okay, uh, looking forward to hearing from that. One more question. This seems, this seems a bit, this might take some time. So, uh, great talk, many thanks. Can you comment on how CGMST deals with potential confounding uh, effects of recombination? You show that SNPs and CGMST tree were similar in paratype A. Is that because paratype A doesn't be combined? Uh, how about Salmonella genus SNP tree versus CGMST? Well, that's a very interesting question. Uh, well, that's, yeah, it's actually multiple things. Uh, First thing is that in terms of recombination, uh, you actually should be able to expect CGMST works better in terms of handling uh, recombination because uh, in terms of CGMST, you treat one gene as only one element. No matter how many SNPs in on there, you only get one change. In that case, uh, you get less affected by this external recombination, which is one of the main source of of the main result of recombination. And then uh, second thing is about uh, how it affects, uh, I can take one example in Samnera Agona. Uh, we try to do core genome SNPs in Agona uh, several years ago. We have to remove all the recombination, otherwise the tree is meaningless. It's one, reason is that you cannot handle the combination well. Second reason is actually there's a large profage in Agona. It shouldn't be in core genome, but it's been treated as part of the core genome. There's lots of recombination in the profage. As a result, it, the tree being messed up. So we do not see the problem. It's partially because CGMST handles recombination better. It's also part of because the profage will not be included in CGMST scheme from beginning because CGMST scheme is not set up for every single serowa. It's been set up for the whole genera. It's actually being more conserved than any ad hoc core genome if you use only a small set of genomes. And then the last question is about the phylogeny. Uh, that's actually been one thing is that CGMST scheme you actually got a problem in deep phylogeny. Uh, what we see is that uh, if you actually go beyond the serotype level, or we say the EBG or HC900 level, it will start to saturate with time because we only get like 3,000 sites to change. In that case, if you actually go to deep phylogeny, uh, for now, I think you still better of your SNPs. Uh, but uh, in our practice, CGMST is still being used, being useful because it allows me to actually identify the core genes easily and get alignment quickly. So we actually do sort of multiple local sequence analysis, um, SA on CGMST schemes in that case. Okay. Okay, very quickly because we're running out of time. Can you make the CGMST scheme available on GitHub with command line where users won't have to go to Entropace? Well, 
same question, same answer, yes and no. Uh, okay, uh, there's a, it's a yes, a yes and a no and a yes. <laughs> the first thing is that in uh, Italki, the same package, it also do a MST. I think Navio has actually tried to use it. I don't know whether he succeed or not. Basically, we offer all the tools of secure MST in Italki as well. So you'll be able to set up a secure MST database. You'll be able to do the typing, use the uh, use Italki. Uh, but second thing is still, you will not be able to get any of your designations in Entry Base if you use Italki alone because we encourage data sharing. But the last thing is yes, again, because uh, we are going to release uh, some singularity container uh, very, very soon. We are testing it. We are going to go to alpha testing in like weeks. With that, you are going to be able to do all, most of the things uh, locally. You do assemble, uh, you assemble showreads locally. You do annotation locally. And then, you you will do uh, the singularity container will submit uh, everything into entry base and the entry base will return you back uh, for the typing results. In that case, you don't need to upload the shortage to entry base anymore. You can reserve all this information, but you will also still be able to get your uh, MST result quickly. I hope that solves the, the question. Yep, that's excellent. All right, that's all the time for uh, that's all the time we have right now. Please keep the discussion up. Um, put questions in conference room one on the Discord, and uh, hopefully Jeremy will stick around after the session, and he and everyone can have some one-on-one -on -one to do some further discussion.